Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is the Cornell Princeton Center for Network Programming. And this is our second Hangout on Air. Just to remind everyone, we have one of these online talks every month. And uh, the idea is to give insights into our research on network programming, uh, both at Princeton and at Cornell. My name is Stefan Smolka. And I, uh, today, I have the unusual pleasure of being both the host of this talk and the speaker. Um, my advisor, Nate Foster, is currently on the West Coast. And so to avoid technical issues, I will uh, be playing double duty. So again, um, my name is Stefan Smolka. I'm a PhD student at Cornell. And today, I want to give a tutorial on a formal system called Netcat. that was designed specifically with programmable networks in mind. And so I want to show you a little bit how Netcat can be used to program networks, to model the behavior of networks, and reason about it, and finally, to verify important network program, uh, properties either by hand or fully automatically using um, an automatic verification tool. Before we get started, um, I just want to mention that there will be a questions and answers session at the end of my talk. Um, so if you have any questions during the talk, um, you will find that there is a live chat located on the right side of the video. So please post uh, questions there. And um, I will try to answer them at the end. So today, I have the pleasure to present not only my own work, but really the work by a large number of people who have worked on the Netcat project over the last couple of uh, three to four years. And so this is really uh, collaborative work uh, across several institutions. Um, my talk is largely based on the three papers you can see on the bottom. Of course, I, I, I'm not trying to go into all the de technical details of these papers. I want to focus largely on applications and give you some uh, nice overview of the sorts of things that we can do with Netcat. Um, but of course, um, very much I encourage you to, if you're, if you're interested, to afterwards go and take a look, closer look at these papers, and um, especially if you're interested in, in the technical details that I won't be able to cover today. So as a brief prelude, I'd like to share with you sort of my personal take on why I think that Netcat is really exciting. And that's because my heart is sort of split between theory on the one side and applications and uh, practice on the other side. And I feel that often there's really a big gap between the two. They're sort of studied in different research communities. And sometimes there's not all that much communication between the two. And I think that's extremely unfortunate because unfortunate because I strongly believe that the theoretical tools developed by one community can be used to great effect to solve challenging practical problems on the applied side. And so Netcat is really a great testament to that. So if you look at the applied side of things, um, it's really amazing um, the sort of cool applications that have been developed in just three years or so uh, based on Netcat. And just so just to give a few examples, um, there's a compiler that implements high-level programming abstractions, so that make it much easier to, to program uh, your networks. Um, one of these abstractions is a form of network virtualization that we will see later. Um, and there's also a verification tool that allows you to automatically check that your network um, satisfies important properties. So for example, you can check that the hosts in your network are indeed co connected so that they can communicate, or that there are no forwarding loops in your network, or that, um, for example, untrusted traffic uh, is, is correctly filtered out by the network, and various other properties. There's also some cool work on um, network measurements and network queries that can be used to um, sort of uh, measure various things that are going on in your network. And, and there's various other um, systems based on Netcat, like uh, Propane and SDX and, and much more. And so if you go and look at the technical section of these papers for these applications, you'll find that really the main enabler of all of them 
are sort of these rich uh, tools from the theory toolbox that uh, NETCAD provides. So we have sort of all these theoretical tools at our disposal, disposal when we try to design uh, applications based on NETCAD. So for one, we have um, a denotational semantics. And this gives us sort of a solid mathematical model of, um, of, of the meaning of our NETCAD programs. We have a sound and complete axiomatization of program equivalence in NETCAD. And this allows us to uh, reason about uh, program equivalence equationally. And for example, this is used to um, verify that the compiler is indeed correct, that the transformation it performs are correct. Um, maybe most importantly, there is an automata model for NETCAD. So any NETCAD program can be translated to a sort of automata. We call it a NETCAD automata. And vice versa, any automata uh, corresponds to some program. And so this, this uh, NETCAD automata model gives us sort of a more operational view of NETCAD uh, that's much more amenable to um, uh, uh, algorithmic manipulation in many cases. And so almost all the applications use this automata representation um, um, to, to perform their tasks. And then finally, um, we have a symbolic representation. And this is really key to make our application scale to the size of large networks. Um, so with that, um, I want to dive into it. Let me give you a brief outline of the things that I want to talk today about. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about the design philosophy between, uh, behind NETCAT. What are sort of the, the goals behind the language design? And how can we use NETCAT to model basic uh, network behavior? Next, I would like to talk about how to reason about um, network programs, NETCAT programs, and how to verify uh, properties of them automatically. And then finally, I want to show you some high-level programming abstractions that NETCAT provides, and also show you how they are implemented by, by the compiler. And so let's get started with uh, language design and modeling. And so NETCAD really starts from, from this question, what is, are sort of the most essential features that you need in a language that you want to use to program networks? And it, it can be, this can be boiled down to basically three um, classes. So one obvious thing you want to do in a network is to forward uh, packets along paths through the network. And it turns out that a natural way to express these forwarding paths is using regular expressions, which is you know, a well-studied existing formal system. So we'll just use that. Now, of course, we don't want to forward all packets along the same paths, right? So we need some way to, uh, pack it, uh, to classify packets based on some of the values uh, in some of the fields of the packet. So, right, so for an incoming packet, we'll take a look at some of, um, of its fields and then make forwarding decisions based on that. So we need some way to, to classify packets. And again, there's already an existing uh, formal system to do that sort of thing, namely a Boolean algebra. So NETCAT um, has this Boolean algebra built in. We have a true and false uh, primitive. True matches on all packets. False doesn't match on any packets. And uh, importantly, we have this test, f equals n, that matches on all packets whose f field is equal to the value n. And then we have the standard Boolean connectors, uh, Boolean conjunction, Boolean disjunction, and negation. And so with this system, we can build arbitrary Boolean predicates to classify our packets and match on exactly the packets that we want to match on. Now, luckily for us, um, this combination of a Boolean algebra with regular expression is not a new thing. It's actually been studied for, for about two decades. Um, it was introduced in 96 by Dexter Cozen and is called a Cleany algebra with tests. And so much of the sort of theoretical foundations that that we that NETCAD is based on and that we um, exploit in our applications really comes from this uh, Cleany algebra with tests um, system. 
that's been studied, you know, for a long time in the literature. And we can sort of exploit all the insights from that. Um, finally, there's one more language feature, feature that we need, namely packet modifications. So sometimes we want to rewrite some of the packet fields. For example, we may want to rewrite an IP address or some MAC address. And so we also add some network primitives to our language. Um, so in particular, we have this modification operator that allows us to rewrite the F field of a packet to some new value n. Now there's also this link operator, A link B. And this allows us to forward packets that are located at switch A across the link to switch B. And the reason I have listed this here in a packet modification is that mathematically speaking, you can think of this as just another modification. Namely, this link modifies the, log, the, the position of the packet from A to B. So you can think of the position, the location of a packet in the network as just another logical field that can be modified using this link primitive. And so what NetCAD really is is this combination of a cleaning algebra with tests with some extra network primitives. And that's where the name NetCAD comes from. So let me give you an example for a very simple NetCAD program. So this program matches on all packets that are located at switch 6, port 88. Uh, and it rewrites their destination IP address to 10.0.0.1, and then multicasts the packet, so it creates two copies of the packets, and sends them out of both port 50 and port 51. And so you can see that we're using here the, the plus operator, also called the union operator, um, um, to create two copies of the packet and uh, send them out of multiple ports. And the sequential composition operator, the semicolon, is used to sort of um, do thing, one thing after another sequentially. And you, you'll be familiar uh, with that from, from any imperative programming language. So let me dive a little bit deeper into uh, one of the main design goals of, of NetCat, and namely that's modular composition. And so that's the idea that. Um, um, given some program fragments, so some, some, some submodules of your program, you should later be able to take these fragments and then compose them to larger programs. Um, and um, actually, this is best illustrated by an example. So let's take the case of sequential composition. Imagine you write um, some policy um, to filter traffic, so some firewall policy. And you also write a forwarding policy. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is to develop these two applications sort of independently. So when we write the firewall, we shouldn't have to worry about forwarding. When we write the forwarding policy, we shouldn't have to worry about the firewall. And then we can take these two things and sequentially compose them to first filter out the traffic um, that's sort of untrusted that we want to filter out, and then afterwards forward the remaining packets. And so that's what sequential composition allows us to do. And so in particular, the idea would be that you know, these, the firewall policy and um, the forwarding policy could already be sort of complicated programs you know, that inside um, are, again, composed of smaller components and so on. And, um, and the important thing here is that they can sort of be uh, developed independently, maybe even by different programmers, and uh, they don't interfere. So that's the idea of modular composition. Um, let me also show you the, the other composition operator called parallel, parallel composition. I also sometimes call it union. And here the idea is that intuitively we create two copies of the incoming packet. And then um, we give one packet to the monitoring policy and one to the forwarding policy in this case. Um, so, so imagine um, that. Uh, you want to send a packet every once in a while if it satisfies certain properties to the controller for further inspection. Um, so you might write a monitor processing to that to do that. But independently of that, you always want to forward your packets through the network. And so those things you want to sort of execute in parallel and independent of each other. And parallel composition allows you to do just that. 
um, uh, one uh, typical example to use this is also for, for multicast, where you create two copies of the packet and send one out of port one and one out of port two, for example. OK, so with this, I want to close the uh, section on language design and talk a little more about how we can uh, model entire networks and then how we can reason about these networks and verify uh, network properties automatically. OK, so in the previous section, I showed you some small, simple programs uh, that we can use to program our network. Um, but we can also go the other direction. So assume you have some network. Maybe it wasn't programmed using Netcat, but maybe some other language or some other means. Um, we can now also uh, encode um, that the behavior of that network in Netcat. So for one, we encode, encode the switch uh, forwarding tables. Um, and here, the thing to notice is that a forwarding table is basically this cascade of conditionals where every row in the table uh, corresponds to one conditional statement that checks if the incoming uh, packet matches the pattern specified in that row, and if so, applies the action uh, that's specified in that row. And otherwise, um, um, sort of falls through to the column, uh, to the row below in the table. And so really, uh, these forwarding tables can can be very naturally encoded in Netcat using these uh, cascading if-then-else statements. Um, maybe more surprisingly, we can also um, model the network topology, so the links in the network, um, using just another Netcat program. And so in particular, um, to encode a network, we just take the union, or the sum, of all the links that occur in the network. And so intuitively, what that program does is, um, is to, to look at a packet. And if it's located at a particular position in the network, it will apply the corresponding link and um, sort of send it to the other side of that link. Now, of course, it's important to note that this sort of program you see here is not really meant to program the network. So um, of course, the network is sort of a physical thing that just exists. And we can sort of uh, just write some code to, to, to modify the topology. Uh, rather, the idea here is to, to model some existing network topology and model its behavior in our formal system. OK, so once we have these two components, we can actually uh, model the end-to-end -end behavior of an entire network. So imagine you have this uh, green topology program that specifies the behavior of your topology, your network topology. And you have a switch program that uh, models the behavior of all the forwarding tables in your network. So we can now sequentially compose the two and then uh, iterate this sequential composition. And this will model the behavior of the network. But to show you this, this is best shown by some animation. So suppose um, some packet enters the network. The first thing that happens is that the topology will send the packet across the link to the first switch. Once the packet is at that switch, it will pro be processed by the switch and send out at some port. Now the process repeats, and the packet will again be sent across the topology to yet another switch, where it will be again processed by the switch and sent out of some other port, and so on and so forth. And so it's really this iterated processing of the topology followed by the switch for an indefinite number of times until eventually the packet reaches the edge of the network. So it sort of reaches some host, and so it will no longer be forwarded. And so the Klini star operator allows us to, to express exactly this iterated behavior. And so what we get is a model for, for the end-to-end -end behavior of the entire network. OK, so once we have this model, we can now start asking questions about this model and see if it, uh, if it um, satisfies certain properties. So for example, we may wonder if um, our network is connected, if the hosts can communicate with each other, if they can ping each other. Um, and ideally, you would like to check that automatically. 
So, so one natural question is, does the network forward uh, packets from ingress to egress? And the way to do this and to ask this question in Netcat is, um, is to write down some equivalence between programs. Um, and, and this can be done for lots of properties. So in this particular case, we would take our network model, topology sequentially composed with switch, and that iterated with clean star. And we pre-compose it with an in predicate that captures um, the locations where uh, packets can enter the network and uh, compose it on the other side, on the right side, with a predicate out that captures where um, packets can leave the network. And now we want to make sure that the resulting uh, program is not equivalent to false. False is the program that just drops all packets. So we want to make sure that this program does not drop packets, that the packets don't get lost somewhere in the network, but that they get indeed forwarded um, from one from the ingress of the network to the egress. And so you can see how this question reduces to a question about program equivalence in Netcat. And in fact, many other questions uh, reduce to program equivalence as well. So just to give you some examples, um, one question we can reason about is if your network contains forwarding loops. Um, another uh, typical question um, is if you know your, your network um, uh, correctly filters out untrusted traffic. Um, we can also reason about optimizations that the compiler performs and transformations and such these sort of things. Now, once we've posed this question, we now, of course, want to answer the question. And there's two, sort of two ways of doing this. So one is the manual way to do it. And um, so Netcat actually comes with, with this large set of axioms that you can see here. And these axioms capture exactly when two programs are equivalent. And, and in, in fact, they, they capture this in a very precise formal sense. So whenever we can show that two programs are equivalent using these axioms, they are indeed equivalent. So that's what's called soundness. That's sort of a, a, a property you definitely want to have. It just tells you that your axioms are indeed correct. But more surprisingly, we also have a completeness property here. So whenever two programs are equivalent, there exists a proof using only these equational um, axioms. So this means that we can always rewrite one of side of the program to look just syntactically like the other side of the program whenever these two programs are equivalent. It's always possible to do this. Now, of course, to do this by hand is sort of tedious. And so if, if you care about network properties, this is really not the right way to go. Um, um, however, these axioms are extremely useful if you one reason, for example, about the correctness of some compiler transformation in a parametric way, where you don't know exactly um, what program you're transforming, you just know that it has certain properties, and you want to um, um, prove that this transformation is correct. So for that, these axioms are really useful. Uh, but if we have a particular property in mind, we can do better. We can actually decide this question of equivalence fully automatically using our decision procedure. So that's uh, an algorithm that takes in two programs and either says yes if the two programs are equivalent or no if the programs are not equivalent. And so the, the main theoretical insight behind the decision procedure is that any Netcat program uh, can be transformed to a form of automaton. Uh, which you call a Netcat automaton. And, um, and in fact, Netcat automata and Netcat programs are exactly um, equivalent in expressive power. So any program can be translated in a, to an automaton, and any automaton can be transformed to a program. And um, sort of the, the, the practical relevance of this is that these automata are much easier to manipulate and analyze algorithmically. And so to decide equivalence of two programs, the first thing we do is translate both of them to automata. 
And now we can answer these question, this question by analyzing the automata. And so what we do is to check if the two automata are bisimilar. Bisim and that's sort of the, the standard notion of equivalence on automata. And, and, and of course, the theorem we have here is that if uh, the automaton corresponding to P is equivalent to the automaton corresponding to Q, then indeed P and Q are equivalent, and vice versa. So this allows us to um, check program equivalence fully automatically and uh, using some symbolic techniques uh, also quite efficiently. So with this, I want to close the section on verification and talk a little bit about the high-level programming, programming, <laughs> excuse me, programming abstractions that uh, Netcat provides. And also show you um, on an example how, how these uh, abstractions are compiled down to uh, forwarding tables that can be installed on, on network switches. So I want to illustrate this using a very simple example. Um, so here we have a small network consisting of two uh, switches, A and B. And they're connected through some link uh, on ports 3 and 4, respectively. And we want to implement a very simple program. Um, we simply want to forward packets along these two red arrows going from the left side to the right side. So in particular, packets uh, entering switch A at port 1 should be forwarded um, out of port 5 at, at switch B, and similarly for packets entering switch A at port 2. So there's several ways to do this in Netcat. And I want to start sort of with the simplest and most naive way of doing it, and then show you some, some better ways of doing this. Um, so the simplest way to, to do this is to write what we call a local program. In a local program, we basically just specify um, the input-output behavior of both switches individually using two programs, one for switch A and one for switch B. So in this case, that's quite simple. Um, at switch A, we simply send all packets out of port 3. But now you can see that we actually have a problem at switch B. So imagine a packet enters at port 4 of switch B. We now have to make a decision if we want to send that packet out of port 5 or out of port 6. And the thing to notice here is that switch B doesn't have uh, the information to make that decision, right? Because once the packet is uh, at switch B, we no longer know, in general, where the packet came from. So in fact, we need to modify the policy at switch A in this case. Um, so we need to write some extra state to the packet at switch A that switch B can then read off to make the right decision. So we'll modify our program at switch A. Um, for packets that come in at port 1, we'll write some marker, um, so the number 1 to, to an extra header field in the packet that I'm calling tag here. And then we send the packet out of port 3. And similarly, if the packet enters at port 2, we'll write a 2 to this extra header field and then send the packet out. Now with this modification, um, switch B can read off this information and then forward the packet appropriately, depending on the tag. So you can see this is a little tedious. Uh, I mean, I've, I've shown you here a very, very simple program. And already, we have to um, start worrying about this extra state that we need to introduce to programs. And um, you can imagine that as your network grows larger and as you're trying to write more complicated programs, uh, reasoning about this sort of state that you have to add to the packet becomes very tedious and um, error-prone. And so I want to show you a more natural way to, to specify the same program. And so th the basic idea behind a global program is that instead of writing separate programs for the different components in the network, we want to write just a single program that describes the behavior of the entire network. And then we'll have the compiler worry about how to partition this global program into, into a local program fragments for the individual switches. And so 
In fact, we can encode these two red arrows directly in Netcat. So we have syntax to do this directly. And so the program becomes just the union of the two red arrows. So the red arrow on top, for example, is just the program that matches on packets at port 1, then sends the packets across the link from A to B, and finally sends them out of port 5. And similarly for the, for the um, red arrow on the bottom. And so this global program is just the union of these two red arrows. And so you can see this is a much more natural way of, of specifying uh, this forwarding behavior. And um, now, as a programmer, we don't have to worry anymore about the fact that you know, really switch A needs to add some state to, packet, to the packet um, so that switch B can um, uh, decide what to do correctly. This was now left to the compiler to figure out. Finally, um, there's actually an even nicer way of doing things um, that we call uh, virtual programming. And the idea is that um, when we program, we can sort of abstract away from the details of the physical network. And we can choose really an arbitrary virtual network as long as we specify some mapping of that virtual network to the physical network. And this will often simplify programming the network dramatically. So in this case, a sensical choice of a network is a so-called virtual big switch that um, simply exposes all the ingress and egress ports of the network on one single virtual switch. And now the program becomes trivial. We just um, um, take the packets that arrive at port 1 and send them out of port 5. And for packets arriving at port 2, we'll send them out of port 6. And so now we don't even have to worry about links anymore. Um, a reason why this is really nice, this abstraction, is that if we later decide we want to add a firewall in here, um, we're exactly in this situation that I showed you earlier. We can now just um, sequentially compose our forwarding policy with a firewall policy. And we can sort of um, develop these two programs independently and maintain them independently. I just want to quickly mention that virtual programming is much more powerful than I was able to show you in this example. So in fact, we can have multiple arbitrary virtual networks on top of a single physical network and implement things like you know, sharing, where the network is shared between um, several tenants. Um, and we can do things like expose only a subset of the physical network in the, in the virtual network. Um, and, and, and similar things. Um, we can also use several, uh, different networks, virtual networks, to handle different forms of traffic. So for example, you might imagine that um, you want to forward uh, your SSH traffic in a special kind of virtual network and all other traffic in a, in a different virtual network and things of that sort. And all of these things are, are possible and um, supported by our compiler. So let's talk a little bit about compilation and how to implement these programming uh, abstractions. So the Netcat compiler consists of three components. And these three components uh, correspond exactly to the um, three programming abstractions that I showed you. So on the bottom of the pipeline, there is a local compiler that takes these simple local programs. So remember, a local program was one that specified uh, the behavior of the individual switches. And so it takes these local programs and translates them to forwarding tables that can then be installed uh, in, on networking switches, for example, open flow switches. Um, on top of the local compiler, we implement the global compiler. And so the global compiler allows you to write programs that contain links and that specify the end-to-end -end behavior of the network as one program. And so the compiler takes such a program inserts the necessary state, the tags that we saw in our example, where, where necessary, and outputs a number of local programs, one for each switch in the network. So, so it does this uh, partitioning, program partitioning, uh, for us automatically. And finally, we have the virtual compiler sitting on top of the global compiler. And so the virtual compiler takes in a program that's written against some abstract really arbitrary abstract uh, virtual topology.
together with the mapping of that topology or some constraints that specify um, what the mapping of this virtual topology to the physical topology looks like. And then from that, uh, the compiler will synthesize a global program that sort of emulates the behavior of this virtual processing on top of the real physical um, topology. And so I won't have enough time to go into a lot of detail how these different um, abstractions are implemented. But I just want to point out that really each of these components uh, draws heavily from, from our theoretic toolbox that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Um, and just to illustrate this, I want to take a look at how a global compiler works. So there's sort of two main challenges to um, global compilation. So if you remember the example from earlier, we had this example with the two switches, A and B, that were forwarding traffic along these overlapping red paths. And the issue was um, that uh, we had to insert some, some, some tags at switch A so that uh, switch B could uh, sort of make the right decision where to forward traffic. So the global compiler will have to decide when and where to add these tags automatically for us. We'll have to partition programs for us and add states where necessary. There's another technical uh, challenge. And this is that if we sort of add tags naively, one for each forwarding path, we can end, actually end up with uh, packet duplicates. So our program may send more than one packet suddenly. And this is more of a technical problem. Um, but of course, this is really um, something we really want to avoid. Um, Sending black packets multiple times is, is, is not sound with respect to our semantics, but um, we also expect that a programmer would, would be very unhappy to see that, uh, that suddenly uh, packets get sent multiple times to the network. And so these are sort of the two main challenges. So let me show you how we solve these challenges on a very high level. And I should say that really, um, you know, there were, there were several rounds of implementing this global compiler. Um, um, but all of them had some small issues. And the final solution was really to find the right tool in our theoretical toolbox. And once we had the right tool, um, the solution was sort of very natural. And the problem suddenly got sort of simple in some sense. And I, I want to give you a sense of that. So remember, we, we start out with this global program that contains the links. And the issue is that we need to add some state to the program, some explicit state to the program, and um, to figure out where to insert these tags. Here's what we do. We translate the global program to a netcat automaton. And now, suddenly, the state in the program has become explicit. Uh, it turns out that these, these tags, the state that we have to add, corresponds exactly to the states um, of the netcode automaton that we will get. So this solves the problem of, of, um, of making the state explicit. Um, but next, we're going to determinize this automata. And this turns out to be the crucial step in avoiding these packet duplicates. And so it turns out that packet duplicates um, correspond exactly to non-determinism in our netcat automata. And so to avoid these, all we have to do is determinize uh, the automaton. And this is sort of a standard construction that's well understood from automata theory and called the power set construction. And so we can perform this very same power set construction on um, the netcat uh, automata. Um, next. Um, so imagine, like I said, we're going to write this state to th some tag field. And ideally, we want to use as little state as possible, right? So the, the, the resources of our packet may be limited. So we don't want to use a larger header than, than necessary. So one natural question is, how can we avoid using m too many tags? Well, with automata, there's sort of a simple answer to that. Simply minimize your automaton, right? And indeed, we can use sort of standard ideas, again, from, from automata theory to, to minimize our uh, automaton here at this point. Um, for efficiency reasons, turns out it's a better idea to do this heuristically rather than finding the optimal uh, automaton. 
Finally, with the automaton in hand, we can now extract our final local program that specifies the local processing behavior at the individual switches. And the local program really emulates the execution of, of the automaton in the following way. We have one extra state field in the local program. And this state field keeps track of the state in the execution, or the state of the automata, if you want, that we're in. And so an automata transition in, corresponds simply to a modification of the state field uh, in our local program. And so you can see that this sort of uh, this, this, this problem of um, global compilation boils down to sort of standard constructions in automata theory. So this was sort of uh, very surprising. And um, um, in the end, we got a very nice solution. And we could exploit all these theoretical tools for our, for our compiler. So with this, I want to wrap up my talk. Um, I want to talk briefly for that, though, about some ongoing work. So roughly, this falls into um, there's sort of two orthogonal um, extensions of Netcat that we're working on. One is to extend Netcat with state, so state in the data plane that persists. You know, uh, so imagine some registers on your switches that uh, can be modified and that persists across packets. And the other um, line of work tries to extend Netcat with probabilistic features. Um, so let me talk briefly about the stateful features. So here the idea is that you know, many switches nowadays have some, some registers where they can well, maintain some, some state. Um, and you can imagine that as when a packet comes in, some of that state is modified. And um, uh, when the next packet comes in, maybe that state is used to, to make a forwarding decision. Um, and um, so stateful netcat uh, tries to ex uh, extend the netcat language with primitives to, to, to model this sort of um, state. And, um, and how to reason about programs that now can contain uh, this sort of state. Um, you may remember, if you, if you were here for our last month's talk, um, on Snap. This may look familiar to you. Um, the difference is that Snap is a little more focused on um, how to program such networks and how to compile these programs, while this line of uh, work is a little more concerned with how to reason about these programs. But, but the two are closely related. In probabilistic Netcat, we um, try to capture some of that random behavior that you find in networks. So why do I say there's random behavior in networks? Well, there's really several reasons. So one is that you don't really know ahead of time what sort of traffic your network or your host generate. And so you can't say exactly what sort of traffic you will see in that network. So that's one source of randomness. Um, second, um, networks uh, uh, exhibit failure sometimes. So links may fail every once in a while. And we want to reason about, um, uh, about the behavior of the network in cases of failures. And third, there's also some, some uh, randomness that can be inside the network. So if you look at randomized routing algorithms, they will, um, or efficient routing algorithms like ECMP, they will typically um, split traffic across multiple paths in the network. And so you don't know ahead of time which path a particular packet will take through the network. And so we want to be able to reason about all these sorts of things. And we're designing an extension of Netcat that allows us to do that. Uh, and so here, the semantics is based on Markov kernels. So to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that Netcat offers a rich sort of theoretical foundation for, for software-defined networks, and that these mathematical tools um, that, that come with Netcat are really, really useful in building you know, powerful applications um, for networks. Um, so, so the applications I have shown you so today were uh, the compiler and also the verification tools. Um, there's also very, various other um, applications um, so that, that are worth looking at if you're interested. So with that, I want to thank you. Um, and I will now um, take some questions. So, Feel free to post some question 
in the live chat, and I will try to, to select some and answer them. OK, so here's a question. Uh, beyond the extensions you already discussed, what are the main open questions surrounding Netcat? Right, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I would say that uh, we're actually in a very, like on the theoretical side, we're in a very nice situation. We, the, the system is really very well understood. Um, so um, it's actually, I have a hard time coming up with an open question about standard Netcat without any um, further extensions. Um, one, one thing that we've been working on a little bit, but haven't published a paper on yet is uh, about applying network uh, program synthesis to Netcat. So can we uh, synthesize uh, Netcat uh, policies automatically from some higher level uh, specifications? Uh, and so I, I suppose that's not a very theoretical question, more more applied question, but that's something uh, that, um, yeah, that's I would call that an open question, how to do that efficiently in Netcat. So in case there are any other questions, feel free to post them and um, try to give an answer. OK, I think there's another question coming in. Um, could you give a sense for what kind of applications have been implemented using Netcat? Um, are there any distributed routing applications such as PGP? Yes, so there is a paper on using Netcat for synthesizing PGP policies. Uh, policies. Um, I think I, I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, let me recall the name. Um, so if you s switch to the very beginning of my talk, I had uh, propane. So there's a system called propane. And that's indeed a, um, a system to, um, to synthesize uh, PGP uh, configurations uh, using Netcat or based on Netcat. There's also the SDX system, which is loosely based on um, Netcat. So SDX is a software-defined internet exchange. Um, they use mostly the sort of uh, programming abstractions that uh, Netcat and similar systems provide. Uh, and so they rely on a fast compiler that can um, you know, take these, these uh, high-level policies that are composed sequentially and using union and et cetera. And they also use this idea of using uh, virtual abstract topologies to, to simplify uh, programming and reasoning about uh, uh, programs. So these are sort of the two, uh, two applications I'm aware of. There's also uh, interesting work on network queries. I guess I mentioned this briefly. Um, so here the idea is that we, that, um, we sort of build a policy or a, a query language, declarative uh, query language that allows us to specify which um, which network packets uh, we want to sort of measure, and uh, and so there's there's two papers on this. Uh, one of the papers uh, that I'm aware of, um, they try to basically push all these uh, query operations to the edge of the network so that they can be performed on the end hosts rather than inside the network. And so there's a sort of compiler to do that. OK, let me take another question. Um, does Netcat produce optimized code, or does it depend on the compilers? Right, um, so that's, that's really a compiler question. I mean, uh, Netcat, right, uh, we use to, to specify these IO programs, and then the compiler produces the, the, the tables. And yes, um, so our compiler um, has some a lot of optimizations to make sure that these uh, the resulting tables are small. Um, one um, technique we use to do this is that we have um, a intermediate representation called forwarding the decision diagrams, and these sort of um, by construction um, compress 
um, the forwarding tables into into uh, uh, to to a minimum. Um, I mean, not in a formal sense that it's the smallest table possible, but um, so we don't have uh, theorems about this. But there are certain uh, properties of the forwarding decision diagrams that uh, that lead to small uh, tables in practice. And there's also some some optimizations that we can perform on on this representation to to get even smaller tables. Um, in the case of the global compiler, you saw that we use automata minimization to sort of um, minimize the the number of bits we need to encode the state in the program so that we don't have to write too much information to the packets as uh, they traverse the network. So these are the two sorts of things that, that um, I'm aware of. All right, so thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, I just, um, before I close, I uh, want to mention that there will be another talk um, next month by Mohamed Shabazz uh, from Princeton. And he will talk about a system called uh, PySex, uh, which uh, was described in a sitcom paper uh, in 2016. And so I hope you join us again for that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.